Our adventure in the Caribbean island known as the Island of a Thousand Blessings starts right now. These steps are marked by stories that are still vivid in the walls of the castle San Felipe del Morro in San Juan, Puerto Rico. We follow that historic path for a week to explore the Caribbean island, and that adventure starts here in Old San Juan. As we made our way into the castle, we were welcomed by the refreshing Atlantic winds that once brought Christopher Columbus to the island that was immediately claimed by Spain upon his arrival in 1493. The San Juan Bay became a strategic point to maintain power in the Caribbean and continue with a discovery expedition across the New World. El Morro was built on the tip of San Juan to protect the city. The six-level fort that sits 145 feet above sea level was named in honor of Spain's King Philip II. El Morro went through different phases of construction throughout history from the time it was first constructed by Spain until it was occupied by the U.S. Army in the late 1800s. From 1535 more or less that it started to be constructed up to precisely the 17th century where, when it was uh, a very important part of the construction process and it ended in the 18th century and we have it here today, still standing, still strong, a privilege to have it here in Puerto Rico. It's precisely the biggest uh, fort under the American flag. Bueno, el Morro era una, un ente militar, era un, para servicio militar, aquí lo que había eran soldados. Eh, no había, por ejemplo, familia de soldados, era simplemente el soldado era el que vivía acá. O en tiempos de paz ni, vivía, ni siquiera vivía acá se arrejuntaba o vivía, sí, lo que llamábamos a rejuntar, el soldado común y corriente que venía de España o era conscrito aquí en Puerto Rico, se arrejuntaba con alguna doña y, y se iban a vivir en una casita en la, alrededor de las murallas de San Juan, sí, así era. Venía un momento de peligro, vente, y tenía que venir a servir. Solamente cuando en época de peligro era que había soldados permanentemente viviendo dentro del castillo. This area right here is where the soldiers back in the 1700s spent most of their time. In average, they got about three pounds of food. The food was prepared here in El Morro. If you come back here and take a look, this was what the kitchen looked like back then. The main mission for historians like Denise, Ramon and Luis on the fort today is to preserve the history and share the legacy with the thousands who visited El Morro. So, would you 
you guys are here in El Morro today, beautiful day in San Juan. First time here? Yes. <laughs> what is it like? It's absolutely gorgeous. I love seeing the ocean and the winds all nice and breezy. <laughs> okay, where are you guys from? Uh, Georgia. Um, my mom and my dad originally from Puerto Rico. Oh, but so what does it feel like to come, you know, to San Juan and kind <clears> of <throat> experience all that history that we have in our blood? It's amazing. Like, it always feels like home when I come and visit because all of my family lives here on the island and we're the only one who lives in the States. So coming here is always like home, no matter where we are in the States, this is always home. Okay. Do you guys like history or? I do, but we we haven't really learned anything about like, the Mojro yet, but just seeing it and from what my mom's told me, it's it's pretty interesting. I'm dressed as a member of the Puerto Rican militia from the late 18th century. This is because we are representing the militia that helped defend the island of Puerto Rico against our last great British invasion. In 1797, the British, that at that time they were the most powerful nation in the world, they had just taken over the island of Trinidad and they came and invaded Puerto Rico. Here in San Juan, we had the professional soldiers. They were called the Fixed Regiment of Puerto Rico. But because of the magnitude of that attack, they had to call for help from the Puerto Rican militia. These were, it was just like a, our National Guard today, more or less the same thing. Men from all over the island that they had military training. They came to San Juan to help repel that invasion. And I'm dressed in that fashion. In here at El Morro, we have uh, an educational program designed precisely to that, to help uh, our, uh, our Puerto Rican islanders and visitors mm -hmm. to learn about that invasion. And we fire this three pound cannon to help them know how the defense of the island back then took place, how different military things were back then. Yeah, it really does take you back to that time because we were downstairs getting some video and we heard the, the blast. Yeah, heard it. And I told my photographer, I was like, what was that? And so I'm glad it was this and it wasn't something else. Uh -huh. It is really hot here. So yes. I'm sure it is an honor to be able to wear this and represent, what, 500 years of history? Right, right. It is an honor, a privilege also. And it is hot, but I'm sure I'm a little bit cooler than you are because <laughs> this is from, it's made of natural fibers. Oh. And when you sweat, it stays inside and the little breeze that comes around keeps you kind of cool. Oh. So it's, it's not that bad as it looks. Maybe we should wear one of those when yeah. we go around the island. Right, right. Um. Well, they were quite intelligent back then. We don't realize it, but they knew what they were into. You're watching UTVS, local TV for the Granite City. Tu única opción de noticias en español en la ciudad de Granito. Dándole una voz a la comunidad hispana. Estamos comprometidos a brindarle toda la información que usted necesita. Acompáñenos. Y escúchelo aquí primero. UTVS News en español. El único ámbito de noticias en español en el estado de Minnesota. UTVS, local TV for the Granite City. So this was used for quick access for the soldiers back in the day then, huh? El Morro was the strongest weapon in the San Juan Harbor, but when the enemy came, it was time to protect it. These historians from the University of Puerto Rico are not here to fight, but they take us back in time and show us how the Puerto Rican militia fired one of these cannons to protect the fort. Bien, este es un cañón de campaña, es el cañón que se lleva al al campo, ¿no? Al campo de batalla. 
Eh, por eso es que tiene las ruedas grandes para poderse mover rápidamente y con más facilidad que los cañones del castillo. Este, el cañón eh, tiene dos piezas principales, ¿no? que es el, lo que sería el, la cureña, que es la pieza de madera, y el, y el cañón en sí. Eh, el calibre del cañón se mide a base del peso de la bala. Este es aproximadamente dos y media libras, dos y media, tres libras. ¿250 libras? No, do, este se, esto se llamaría un cañón de a dos libras oh, o okay. de a tres libras. Oh, okay. Ese es el calibre. Antes no era, no era medida... No era medida... Era este, lo que pesaba la bala. Lo que pesaba oh, okay. la bala, exacto. Y eh, se hace una rutina particular para asegurarse primero de que estuviese limpio, de que no hubiese ninguna ceniza encendida. Eh, después se, car se cargaba, se atacaba con una pieza para llevar la carga lo más, lo más atrás posible. Se ponchaba, el, se, se ponchaba el cartucho con un estilete, una, una varilla de, de bronce, que es esta que está aquí. Y se echaba pólvora, pólvora que salía de, un, de algo parecido a esto, como un cuerno. Nosotros utilizamos una, me una mecha por, por cuestión de seguridad más contemporánea. Uh -huh. Después, pues, después se traía el botafuego, que es la pieza de acá atrás, y con eso se encendía la pólvora o la mecha en, en este caso. La, los, colores, los colores rojos pues, es, es, es de la artillería, ¿no? Ese es el, el color típico de la artillería, el rojo y el bronce de lo, en los botones. En este caso el rojo, el rojo del uniforme nuestro es por la milicia. Sí, no, se usa, no se usa la bala. Por regulaciones federales y por seguridad, por supuesto, y por conservar esta, este hermoso castillo. Porque eso podría salir volando, la, lo que llaman las troneras, Ajá. podrían salir volando si usáramos balas. Y podría causar un accidente bien serio. O sea que por seguridad más bien es que no se está usando. Aunque en, en Estados Unidos, por ejemplo, los recreadores, en ciertas situaciones de recreación histórica, utilizan la bala. Por, por supuesto, con todas las medidas de seguridad sí. posibles para que no vayan a causar ninguna estrofisión. ¿Y cuánto se tardan en prepararlo antes de, de que lancen? El... Bueno, en una situación normal, en combate, en, en aquella época, en menos de un minuto debería estar preparado el cañón. Lo que pasa es que nosotros aquí, para demostración, lo hacemos de una manera lenta, cosa que el público pueda ver cada uno de los pasos. Y lo hacemos de la forma más ceremoniosa posible, ¿ves? Porque en la realidad sería todo mucho más rápido y algunos de los pasos se acortarían. Okay. Pero aquí lo hacemos bien lento y bien ceremonioso para que el público pueda ver y entender cada uno de los pasos que, que estamos haciendo para disparar el cañón. Sí, porque aquí no están combatiendo no, con no, el enemigo. Aquí estamos bien, más bien enseñando. Yeah. Nuestro propósito es educativo y enseñar. ¿Y como en cuántos minutos hacen el otro? And when we asked how much longer until the next demonstration, we found out more historic details that go into this recreation of history. Este es una reproducción de un reloj de finales del siglo XVIII. Wow. Y nos faltan alrededor de cuatro minutos. Si lo comparamos con un celular, el celular probablemente tenga tenga dos minutos atrasado, porque todos los celulares del mundo están con la misma hora. Pues del, del mundo, me refiero de, de, de nuestro uso horario que llaman. ¿no? Aquí, por ejemplo, si, di, si él tiene en su celular que son las 3 de la tarde, el de ellas dice las 3 y el de todo el mundo son las 3. Pero para nosotros que estamos recreando la historia, lo tenemos que dejar llevar por, por el celular de la época. Eso de verdad. De hecho, este tipo de reloj, que es una reproducción del siglo XVIII, se estuvo utilizando normalmente en cualquier parte del mundo hasta prácticamente los años 50 principio de los 60, claro, más, más moderno, la, con los números en, en números este, romanos, arábigos y no, y no romanos, ¿eh? pero más o menos bien, bien parecido a esto. Ustedes aquí están de verdad que recreando la historia sí. eh, detalladamente del reloj, la ropa. Se supone que para poder intervenir en, en sitios así como la interpretación de los castillos, Ajá. tengamos que ser los más estrictos en, la, en las cuestiones de historia. ¿eh? Ellos también ellos nos supervisan. Que, que, lo, que lo cumplamos, nosotros mismos nos supervisamos que lo hagamos lo, lo mejor posible. ¿no? Esa, esa es nuestra función y para, para poder enseñar. Y como ya le explicó, nuestros uniformes son también del final del siglo XVIII y son los uniformes que usaban las milicias disciplinadas de Puerto Rico, que era cualquier ciudadano, que, como le, cualquier ciudadano del país que estaba obligado a defender a la isla en caso de peligro.
watching UTVS, local TV for the Granite City. UTVS News in Espanol, the only Spanish newscast in Minnesota, right here on UTVS. You're watching UTVS, local TV for the Granite City. Watching UTVS, local TV for the Granite City. UTVS News in Espanol, the only Spanish newscast in Minnesota, right here on UTVS. UTVS, local TV for the Granite City. In 1898, Puerto Rico became a part of the United States under the Treaty of Paris. 
At that time, the walls that divided El Morro with the rest of the city came down to allow the population to grow outside of this military fort. In 1897, they started to destroy the walls para dar paso a que, a que creciera la población. Al lado del castillo de San Cristóbal, si ustedes han estado allá o van para allá, estaba la puerta principal que daba hacia la tierra, que llaman puerta de tierra. Toda esa parte, en 1897, se destruyó para que la ciudad pudiera crecer hacia, hacia donde estaría ahora el Hotel Caribe Hilton. Outside of those walls, life found its own path into what Puerto Rico is today. Nearly 4 billion people live in the island that has been expanding politically and economically over the decades. In 1952, Puerto Rico became a commonwealth of the United States. And that has been a controversial topic as many are fighting for Puerto Rico to become the 51st state of the U.S. El Estado Libre Asociado is just a pretty name. It's like we're called a commonwealth, it's just a pretty name. But if you look at all the characteristics, the political characteristics, we're a colony. And that's one of the things that the U.S. Uh, will hate is when they go to all these uh, major conferences, international conferences, and they talk about their commonwealth. You know, immediately someone will say, no, what do you mean commonwealth? You, you, have a com you have a colony, it's called Puerto Rico. So that's kind of a little, that's like the, the hidden baby, you know, where, oh, well, we don't want to call them a colony, so we'll just call them a commonwealth. Puerto Rico, currently a U.S. Commonwealth, voted in favor of statehood for the first time on Tuesday. Voters rejected their current status as a Commonwealth by a 54% to 46% margin. The majority is 61% chose statehood as the alternative. However, U.S. Congress will decide whether or not statehood will be granted. Currently, Puerto Ricans are unable to vote for president and do not have representation in the Senate or House of Representatives. Orlando Rivera, a political analyst from Puerto Rico, shares the importance of Puerto Rican statehood. El beneficio sería tener dos senadores en Congreso y cinco o seis o siete representantes en la Cámara. Este es el beneficio principal, tener voz y tener voz. Porque ahora mismo Puerto Rico tiene un comisionado presidente en Estados Unidos. Él va al Congreso, habla, 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 pero el momento de votar, el niño, no, el señor no tiene voz. Democrats in the island under the Partido Popular Democrático don't support statehood. However, they think the Commonwealth, known as the Estado Libre Asociado, needs a few changes. Yo creo en el Estado Libre Asociado de Puerto Rico este, y creo en, ¿verdad? en, en, la, en la unión permanente con, con los Estados Unidos. Pero no creo que Puerto Rico deba convertirse en Estado, sino permanecer como estamos, como Estado Libre Asociado de Puerto Rico. Ciertamente los Estados Libristas estamos de acuerdo y convencidos que el, que el ELA tiene que ir transformándose eh, y todos sabemos que hay espacio para mejorar. Este, eh, pero yo creo ¿verdad? En, la, en la unión permanente con los Estados Unidos. Yo siento mucho orgullo de que Puerto Rico sea un Estado Libre Asociado de Puerto Rico cuando miramos a nuestro alrededor. Todo lo que nosotros hemos logrado ha sido eh, gracias al Estado Libre Asociado de Puerto Rico. Eh, y sí, eh, cuando te hablo de transformación, entiendo que el ELA tiene que transformarse un poco más para que podamos tener quizás más poderes. Eh, nosotros poder tener un poco más de autonomía, autonomía fiscal. Este, eso se ha discutido ampliamente eh, por los diferentes partidos políticos este, eh, y yo creo que el gobierno de Puerto Rico debe ir moviéndose hacia eso. We are never going to be well defined until that third option is, you know. Given that third option, then I have to make a decision, you know. Yeah. And I'm not anti-U.S., you know, I live here. Um, but I would like to see more authority for Puerto Rico, you know. I mean, right now, Puerto Ricans um, in Puerto Rico, it's, it's a weird relationship because in Puerto Rico, I cannot vote for the U.S. president, but all I have to do is hop on a plane, come to the U.S., and immediately I can vote for the president. So it's a really weird relationship that we have, and uh, 
people think uh, Puerto Rico is a third world country and Puerto Rico is like going to any other state here. I mean, we have all the same law. In fact, our constitution is a replica, a copy of the U.S. Constitution. You know, uh, the U.S. acquired Puerto Rico after the Spanish-American War in the 1800s. Um, President Roosevelt back then declared that it, all instruction in Puerto Rico was to be in English in the schools. Teachers had to be trained. You could not be a teacher if you didn't know English. And to settle that, they even had where they, they would take Puerto Ricans, bring them to the mainland, teach them English, and prepare them as teachers, and then send them back. Finally, the government came, gave up because the resistance was so big by the Puerto Ricans that they just decided to give up on that plan. Uh, in 1917, we became U.S. citizens. And that's what a lot of people don't, don't know here in the States either, that we are U.S. citizens. And that also has created some complications for us in the sense that, like African Americans, when they go to Africa and they talk about Africa being their motherland and this and that, the first thing they're told is, you're not African, you're American. Same thing happens to us Puerto Ricans when we go and talk to people in South America, in Latin America, and we say we're from Puerto Rico, they say, well, you're not, you're not Latin, you're American. So we get that same treatment there, you know, which is very interesting. And if you say New Yorican, then it's even worse. So, you know, we're like at the end, you know, at the pit. Now that we talked a little bit about history and politics, our trip takes us to the south of the island to explore Puerto Rico through the eyes of the people in the town of Salinas. Next week on our adventure in Puerto Rico. We're basically taking a, a sail here around Bahia de Salinas, which is the Bay of Salinas, Puerto Rico. We arrive in the town of Salinas and meet with our friend Juan. He shows us what it's like to live in the Caribbean Sea. You don't want to miss it. TVS, local TV for the Granite City. Hey!